On today's show, the Atlanta Hawks win their fourth straight game, and it happened with a lot of fireworks. DeJounte Murray at the center of the frame for the entire game for the Hawks with a career high in points and a franchise record in field goal attempts, but in the end, a sweep of sorts against the Boston Celtics. We'll get into all of what transpired and more coming up. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1683 of the Lockdown Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Thursday evening into Friday morning. And today's show is brought to you by the folks at FanDuel. And right now, if you're a new customer, you can get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet at FanDuel. And the place to go is FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to get started. Also, I should encourage you, it's out of the podcast, as I often do on this show, to make us your first listen here at Lockdown Hawks each and every day. Please check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, we're also on YouTube, and please subscribe and tell a friend about the podcast. With that out of the way, the Hawks had a pretty wild one again on this Thursday evening, and their fourth straight win, and this one was probably the most shocking of all in some respects. Maybe not necessarily outweighing Monday's game because of the 30 point episode they had on Monday. But in the end, a rematch of that game that was crazy. Their third game in four nights. It was back-to-back for the Hawks. They have now won four games in a row, but it was an incredibly close-fought game. Whereas Monday's game against the Celtics, if you missed it by by chance, was essentially Boston taking a massive lead and the Hawks being great from that point forward. This game was incredibly close the entire way. In fact, the largest lead of the game was eight points. The largest lead of the second half was five points. The largest lead of the fourth quarter in overtime, which is where this game ended up, in overtime was four points. There were 41 lead changes and 14 ties in the game. Those are absurd numbers. They tell you just how close fought this game was back and forth, back and forth. In the end, the Hawks steal it in overtime. And I have to give you a little bit of context, as I am wont to do. I know that not everybody loves that, but I like to give you the entire picture on this podcast. That's kind of the calling card of the show in some respects. The Hawks had the same roster they had recently. DeJounte Murray was on the injury report. We'll come back to him in a second. As we'll talk about a lot, actually. He had uh, back soreness, ended up playing, um, was probably a little bit limited physically, but that did not show up on the statue necessarily in this game. Boston was a little bit healthier this time around than they were on Monday. They got Derek White back. They got Drew Holiday back. They did not have Al Horford in this game, so that was a notable loss. But all that said, the reason I'm bringing this up now is that the Hawks were, and it's almost crazy to say this out loud, the Hawks were 16-point underdogs in this game. And if you're a new listener, I don't say that to tell you to be, you know, it's not it's not about the betting space. It's really about the context and the projections of a game. And the betting market is a pretty good indicator of what's expected for a game. And this was the largest underdog the Hawks had been all year long by a wide margin. And this was game 73. So they were not supposed to win this game in a lot of different ways. It's crazy that the Hawks were literally double-digit favorites 24 hours prior against Portland. And again, they won comfortably because Portland was essentially playing a G League team last night. And that kind of tells you that the perceived gap between what Portland had last night and what Boston had was like 25 points, like just an outrageous amount. But the Hawks were 16-point underdogs in this game. And then not only was it close the entire way, but they, of course, they, they, they stole this game and won at the end. Even if the Hawks had lost this game, which they didn't do, they still would have, you know, quote-unquote, overachieved compared to the, compared to the projections. But, um, yeah, that kind of added to just how intriguing this game was. And, look, if you're a new listener or, or even a regular listener, you may not know this. If you're, if you're returning, you will know this. But... I'm shaking it up a little bit tonight as far as the order of this podcast. Usually I save the player-by-player breakdowns that I do on each and every show after games for the end of the podcast. And I'm going to do that still for eight of the nine guys who appeared for the Hawks in this game. But I think I have to leave with Jonathan Murray, who had one of the crazier nights that you will see in recent history and, of course, was the hero in this one for Atlanta. Before I get to the stats, and they are crazy, he made the game winner in overtime. He also scored all 11 points for the Hawks in overtime. He outscored Boston 11 to 10 in overtime and and at one point win. That tells you the story right there. Obviously, he carried a massive workload in this one and was at the center of the frame the entire way through. He had a career high, 44 points in this game. Previously, his high was 41, which he actually did three times. There's kind of a glass ceiling there for DeJounte. He broke through it in this game. Obviously, that's notable enough, but he also made like legitimately recent NBA history with simply the volume of usage that he had in this game. 
DeJounte Murray took 44 field goal attempts in this one. He's the first player in the NBA to take that many shots in the game since Russell Westbrook in October of 2016. So, you know, seven and a half years ago has been the last time that someone took this many shots in an NBA game. He's only the, he's only the, the third player to take 44 shots or more since 2001, joining Russ and Kobe Bryant, who did it multiple times. But essentially, that, that's a crazy, crazy context for anyone to be in. Here's another one for you. His previous career high was 29 field goal attempts. So he took 50% more shots than he ever had in a game in this one. Yes, there was overtime, but even before that, he was getting up a lot of shots. He took 17 shots in the fourth quarter in overtime. Just all day long, crazy stats, and also a career high with 19 three-point attempts. Quince Iyer postgame told the media that he kind of half-jokingly to DeJounte before the game started, told him to take 16, free th 16 threes in this game, and that would have actually been a career high as well, but he ended up going above and beyond that, shattering his career high in attempts. Obviously, you don't see 44 shots very often. I just kind of lay that out for you. He ended up missing 26 shots in a game. Usually, that is a, a full-on disaster, but in this game, he took a lot of shots, and they were justified. Like, you know, there, there would certainly be times where I would point to a guy overshooting. Uh, you know, he wasn't that efficient in this game. 44 points on 44 shots is not what you want in a vacuum. I'll be the first to say that. But if you're waiting for me to kind of like pile on, I'm not going to do that because he had to carry the usage. You know, for instance, V. Krejci started in this game, played 35 minutes, took one shot. Yeah, there were probably a, a possession or two in the game where Jante probably took a shot that was probably kind of ill-advised. But for the most part, he carried a massive workload and did it reasonably for most of the way. Um, I thought, as I said this last night on the show, I thought, he, I thought he played really, really, really well on Wednesday against Portland. That was a much more measured performance, a little bit more under control. This is one where he just had to cook. He really did. And Boston's a good defensive team. He had to go one-on-one -on -one a lot. And that's one of the gifts of DeJounte. Probably, you know, I would say maybe his number one attribute as far as like what makes him a standout in the NBA is that he is incredibly good at getting to his mid-range, especially, but just getting to his one-on-one -on -one shots. He's a very good player in that, in that sequence. He got a lot of those shots off of this game. He made a lot of them. I'll get into it later, but and sometimes the NBA is about, is about matchups. Like he got to ISO against Porzingis several times in overtime, and that worked. He beat Drew Holiday one-on-one -on -one in the final possession. He beat Jalen Brown. He beat Jason Tatum. He was really, really good against basically everyone for Boston in this game. And naturally, look, the, the national story – is going to be Boston losing twice in a row to the Hawks. And I get that. That's, you know, that's just that's just the nature of the beast. But locally in Atlanta, DeJounte is the big story. And he's certainly earned that. This is a, again, career best night for him, a franchise record for field goal attempts. Like for a team that also employed Dominique Wilkins, uh, he broke, and also DeJounte broke Bob Pettit's franchise record for field goal attempts. Trey's never come close to this. Like no one has had this level of usage basically since Dominique, um, as far as like, in a game for the Hawks. So uh, it was a wild one. It was very impressive. And uh, I felt like I had to leave with that at the top of the podcast because uh, it is sort of the DeJounte Murray game in a lot of ways. Um, briefly about the team stuff. The Hawks had a 119 offensive rating in this game. That was kind of the side of the floor they were better on in this one. They shot it okay. They basically did nothing at free throw line in this one. Only 10 free throw attempts in a game that had overtime. That's a very, very low number. But the big swings were in the possession game for the Hawks in this one. So, Number one, they had 17 offensive rebounds. That's a very good number in any context. And that also led to a whopping 28 second chance points in this one. That uh, The biggest uh, culprit of that was Capella with seven, but West Patrick had three offensive rebounds. McDonald had three. Hunter had two. They were uh, really good on the glass throughout the game. And then there was ball security. So early on, the Hawks had some turnover issues. We'll talk about maybe later on. But they only had 11 turnovers the entire game because they only had three in the entire second half, including overtime. That is fantastic. Now, Boston's not a, a big tournament creation team. That's worth noting. But the Hawks did a really good job taking care of the ball. And sometimes just getting shots to the rim can be important. And the Hawks were able to do that throughout the game. And when they either went in or they when they missed them, they got a lot of rebounds. And uh, just kind of playing the math game there ended up kind of pushing the Hawks to, again, a very narrow victory. Defensively, it wasn't ideal. They had a 119 or so defensive rating in this game. They didn't get killed anywhere except for one place, which was transition. Boston had 27 pass break points in this one. That's a whopping number. And the Hawks were really bad at getting back in this game. That's not anything new. They've been bad in that area a lot of this, a lot of the time this year. But with that out of the way, they were good at pre preventing free throws. They were at least reasonable at contesting shots. And they also crushed it again on the glass, not only offensively, but also defensively, preventing second chances, playing the math game, 
And, uh, you know, Boston didn't shoot it like incredibly well, but they shot it just as well as the Hawks did. The Hawks just won by a tiniest of margins, basically all the margins. And that was why the Hawks were able to kind of steal this one in overtime. But, you know, in the end, it was a Jonte Murray game. It's their fourth one in a row. The Hawks have a little bit of vibe going on right now. Obviously a big one, big picture. We'll get into more on this game as we always would on the show. But first I want to tell you about our friends at Nissan. Are you thinking of kind of driving the lights pushing a little bit further when you're behind the wheel? Do you ever happen to wonder what adventure could be around the next corner when you are driving? Our friends at Nissan have a lot of SUVs with capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. And in 2024, Nissan Rogue is perfect for cityscapes and also great escapes from the city when it comes to getting out there to the country. It also has a class-exclusive Google built-in that is you're always updating. Assistant can call on for almost anything in your vehicle. Gone are the days of connecting your phone because Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3-inch HD Touchscreen screen infotainment system with the Nissan Rogue and the 2024 Rogue is the perfect business crossover for your next big adventure. Also, they have an incredible lineup at Nissan that also features the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder and it seems up to eight people, it has expansive cargo capacity as well, and also has advanced available 4x4 capability with the Pathfinder. They have 284 horsepower, up to 6,000 pounds of towing. And when adventure calls, the Pathfinder is going to be there to answer that call for you. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada, and go find your next big adventure with Nissan. Shop NissanUSA.com. One more time, that's NissanUSA.com. Amazon Fire TV is your best destination for sports, from live games to highlights and in-depth analysis alike. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV to provide access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's for opening weekend of baseball or college basketball's tournaments, you'll actually find out what you're looking for at Fire TV. And they also created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free. That includes all of us at the Locked On Podcast Network, as well as most big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fiery TV channels let you dive into all kinds of game analysis, highlights, and much more. Keep, keep up to date on all the latest in the sports world, from March Madness to the NBA, MLB, football when it's in season, and much more. And not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, cookie videos are available all at the same place with Fire TV. Check out Fire TV channels at Fire TV or Alexa devices right now. If you don't check this out at Fire TV channels, you should. Trust me on this. And to learn more, the place to go is Amazon.com slash TV. One more time, that is Amazon.com slash Locked On Fire TV. All right, we'll dive in now to how this game flowed. And, uh, you know, obviously, I said it before, but it was very, very close the entire way. Boston took their large lead of the game basically in the first seven minutes. They went up, they had a 12-2 run, did Boston to go up by eight points. And the Hawks responded from there. And literally, that was the, as far as the game was out of hand the entire way. That was it. And it never was out of hand from that point forward. Um, the Hawks played nine guys in this game. No Dylan Windler after he played last night. They kind of saved Wes Matthews for this one after uh, putting him on the shelf last night, kind of wisely knowing, and I kind of called that last night, that they were kind of just putting, they were kind of just very clearly saving him for the Boston game. He ended up playing a lot. They actually played a lineup that had Murray, Bogey, Garrison Matthews, and Wes Matthews on the court together, so very small. Um, but anyway, they were able to kind of navigate that. They were down one at the end of the first quarter. I was a little bit afraid because... The Hawks were only down one, and Boston was one of 11 from three. Usually that combination means you're kind of in trouble. And just for the record, if you missed it, going back to Monday, in about three and a half quarters between the end of the game Monday and the first quarter tonight, Boston was two of 30 from three. Two of 30. <laughs> That's like 7%. Just a wild, crazy number. Uh, Murray was really good early on, though. That, uh, that kept happening. And uh, we'll, of course, come back to that later on. The second quarter took forever, basically. Part of that was that there were, there were back-to-back challenges. Um, the Hawks actually were on the right side of both of those. Boston lost one, and then the Hawks won one. Um, Atlanta had their own run of 8 nothing in the middle of the quarter to take the lead. Pretty bizarrely, in a game that had a lot going on, it kind of, was kind of, kind of forgotten afterwards, Trey Young got a technical foul. And as a reminder, Trey Young is not playing. He was in, he was in street clothes on the bench. Uh, he went kind of on the court, which is, I think, what he was called for the technical foul on. That was kind of a memorable play in some respects. Uh, and then Bogey got one a few minutes later. Of course, he is playing, but he got one as well. So there was just a lot of like stop and go nature in that second quarter. Uh, Tatum tried to dunk on Capella and Capella made a nice contest. Did not allow that to happen. Had a couple of words, it seemed like, for Tatum on the way back down the floor. And it was back and forth again. The Hawks were down by four at halftime. They only attempted one free throw in the entire first half and they missed it. So 
Not every day that you see an NBA team not make a free throw and a half, but that happened to the Hawks in the first. They were only down by four, but they were down four. And like, you know, it's, it is what it is. Now, from that point forward, the margin was never bigger than five. It was that close. The Hawks had their own run to begin the third quarter and eight-0 run after that, by the way, beat Krejci. He got four fouls. He ended up uh, being limited because, you know, Veet, <laughs> Veet ended up fouling out in 30 minutes. They had a, He would have played more than that if he had not fouled out. So keep that in mind for later. Uh, Hunter had a big third quarter. He was the only guy that had like a big stretch other than DeJounte in this game is that Hunter had 14 points in the third, hit a couple of threes. He also had a uh, game high 13 rebounds in this one, which is always a, a nice bonus for, for uh, DeAndre. The Hawks made a living at three point line in the third quarter. They made six threes in that period. Um, still though, like it was back and forth again. Jalen Brown had a monster duck at the, at the end of the quarter, but it was kind of just like holding serve, holding serve. Uh, defensively, the Hawks had a couple of, gaffes in allowing Sam Hauser, who is a three-point specialist, I would say, for Boston to be kind of wide open. But even then, they kept bouncing back. And one of the themes of the entire game was just the Hawks being resilient and not letting Boston have their knockout punch. I think a lot of people in the building were probably waiting for Boston to kind of just like put the game away, and they just never could. If it gets a four, the Hawks would score. If it gets a five, the Hawks would score. If it gets a three, the Hawks would score. They, they just kept answering, which was very, very impressive, I thought, the entire way. Atlanta had their biggest lead of the fourth quarter. They were actually up by four with about four minutes to go. But then they allowed a three, three to Derek White. I'm going to fly through this a little bit because there's more overtime to get to. But they, but they made back-to-back threes to take the lead. But even then, Murray missed again with the Hawks down by two. But the Hawks had a huge offensive rebound. Bogey hit a step back three for the for the lead again, and they're back in charge. Um, you know, Again, more back and forth there. Um, they came out of the huddle. A few times in this game, they played Wes Matthews on offense-only possessions. I didn't really quite understand that. Now, on one hand, V had fallen out. So that was part of it. But they could have just played Garrison, who's a better offensive player than Wes Matthews. Like I appreciate the work of Wes Matthews. He's a very intelligent defender, leader, all that stuff. But offensively, like he doesn't really give you a ton. So I was curious about that, but it ended up working out okay for them in the end. Uh, Hunter drew a foul. How about this one? If, this, this sequence is actually funny because the Hawks won the game. But with literally one minute to go, Hunter got fouled and missed both free throws. In a game, the Hawks ended up winning. Uh, for the record, I believe DeAndre came into the night shooting 87% from the line, and he missed two huge ones there. Um, but the Hawks were down by three with under a minute to go after Brown scored, and then it's sort of an eerily similar play to Monday. So if you remember this, it wasn't the exact same situation because the Hawks were winning by one point on Monday when this happened. But the same thing happened again at the very end of a game where the Hawks missed a shot, Got a clutch offensive rebound. The first time on Monday, it was Capella. Tonight, it was DeAndre Hunter. A kickout pass quickly to an open shooter. First, it was Hunter the first time. Bogey tonight. Bogey buries it tonight. And that's a tie game. So, huge, 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 huge play. I can't even express to you. That sequence between Hunter missing the free throws and then Brown scoring, that was a huge swing. And But the Hawks were just unwilling to give the game back. They, they, they were able to hang in there. Big shot by Bogey. That was, other than what DeJounte did in, in, in overtime, the biggest shot of the game at that point. Then, Boston had a chance to win it in regulation. Wes Matthews wisely gave a foul um, that they had one to give with about six seconds to go. And then, in typical Boston fashion, this is not a Boston podcast, but the Celtics just, it was kind of the caricature of the Celtics. I'll, I'll do this now briefly. Um, one of the knocks on Boston the last couple of years is that they really bogged down at the end of games and they kind of get, they kind of settle a lot for contested jumpers. And that happened both Monday and tonight. I mean, the, probably the best example of that was in at the end of regulation in a tie game. The shot they got was a Jason Tatum fall away 28 footer. Now he could have made it. He's capable of making that shot. But in a tie game, you don't want to shoot three at the buzzer. That's a low percentage shot. You want to go to the rim, maybe draw a foul, et cetera. I guess the argument would be that you, you can't lose it in regulation, but that was a bad process by Boston. Good defense by the Hawks. Certainly worth that. But um, yeah. Interesting stuff there. Ironically, DeJounte, who had this fantastic game, and he and he did, he actually missed his last four shots in regulation, which now no one will remember because it, the game because the game kept going. Uh, but that was notable because in overtime, he was incredible. He made his first three shots, all pretty tough shots, honestly. Jumpers that were contested. That's, of course, what he does in some ways. They were going to Porzingis a lot. And actually, after the game, Joe Mazzula, the Celtics head coach, made a very interesting comment uh, I think it was to Gary Washburn of the Boston Globe, and essentially said that they wanted Porzingis to switch out onto Murray, that they were like trying to almost like 
angling for that. I don't know if that was like a play with your food thing for the future or what. I don't, it was an odd quote, but if they wanted it, they got it. And DeJounte beat Porzingis three times in a row, basically. He did miss the fourth one, but and also there was a super weird play after that where DeJounte was called for a technical foul in the backcourt. Because the Hawks won, it, what, it didn't become a huge deal. Um, so we never got an explanation about this. That was a tough call from what I could see. That was a weird one, especially in overtime, to have that called against you. And that led to a four-point possession for Boston. So a potentially huge swing. It didn't end up biting them, but still notable. But that Murray kept shooting. He, he, made, he made another three after that. Uh, a big missed free throw from Tatum with about two minutes to go. That kind of opened the door a little bit. Um, the Hawks called a timeout after White fouled Murray. Um, but another big offensive rebound-ish thing happened. They, they kind of had a lost possession where Wes Matthews had, had, had to kind of heave the ball at the rim to avoid a shot clock buzzer, but he missed it. They got, they got the rebound, ended up in a jump ball under a minute to go, a jump ball in the NBA, which means an actual jump ball between Wes Matthews and Derek White, and the jump ball ended up going out of bounds, but it became the Hawks' ball, and that was a huge play. So there was a 10-second differential, so the Celtics didn't have to foul, even though the Hawks were up by one in the final minute. Murray didn't miss a jump shot that actually probably, I'm not sure, it wouldn't have put the game away, but that would have been a big shot. He misses it over John Brown. Boston calls timeout, and then Brown actually hits what looked to be potentially the game winner, a jump shot over Wes Matthews. But the Hawks call timeout, set it up. Um, as many lamented in Boston, I saw Bill Simmons, for instance, uh, as a prominent Boston fan. Uh, I, do, I don't know why the Celtics didn't deny DeJounte the ball. Uh, fortunately for the Hawks, they didn't do that. But um, DeJounte was obviously taking every, basically every big shot at the end of the game. But in the end, they allowed him to get the ball. It was one-on-one, -on -one, essentially. Now, Drew Holiday is a great defender, but DeJounte just beat him. Uh, and again, a tough mid-range shot. But that's what DeJounte does. He'd been cooking on that shot the entire game. That happened. And the celebration was on from there, including a moment that I should, I should at least flag right now that I know Hawks fans that noticed it really loved it. And it was DeJounte Murray and Trey Young celebrating kind of one-on-one -on -one together near half court right after, the, right after the shot went down. I was, there's been lots of made about Trey versus DeJounte. And I think it's all kind of silly. Like there's even in the fan base, people taking sides. It doesn't actually, it's not productive in any, any shape, way, shape or form. Uh, but obviously there's been talking about trade stuff on all sides. It, I thought it was fun. Um, obviously this is more of a analytical podcast in a lot of ways, but I thought it was notable to have those guys kind of, you know, having a pretty big show of a celebration there. Uh, Trey being really engaged despite being hurt, et cetera. A fun moment there. I, I know a lot of Hawks fans, I know my friend Grant Shirley shared that clip on Twitter. Uh, fans were excited about that, and I, I get why. So from there, it actually wasn't over. So it, it was over, but functionally it wasn't because there was 0.1 seconds to go. And while you can't catch and shoot at 0.1 seconds, you can tip the ball in. So Boston, only down one, had a chance technically – the Hawks didn't guard the ball. It was actually hilarious to see the way the way it was lined up because there was nobody around the ball or out on the perimeter because there had to be a lob and a tip. The inbounds pass, though, literally went in the basket, which, funny, like it's a violation. It doesn't count because nobody touched the ball. But, um, yeah, that was a little bit of an anticlimactic way to end the game, kind of fitting in some respects, I suppose. But um, really, functionally, DeJounte's shot was a pseudo walk-off game winner and uh, a lot of fun to be had there. So, yeah, I mean, we got in the numbers a little bit earlier with DeJounte, but again, he had all 11 points in overtime. And I believe they were literally on five jump shots, if I'm remembering correctly. So just big, up, big ups to DeJounte Murray, a massive game for him. And I'm sure the folks in Boston did not really enjoy themselves on this fine Thursday evening. All right, we'll have more on this when it comes to the player stuff, sans DeJounte, uh, and more. But coming up, but first, though, a word from our friends at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience are what bring home the winning trophy, and that's also what helps you keep your ride or die alive. Even Motors has everything you're looking for to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. They have superchargers and exhaust kits and LED headlights, roof racks, and much more. Whether you're actually into speed, power, or style, Even Motors is going to have you covered across the board. They have over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, and you'll always find exactly what you're looking for at eBay Motors. It would be a guaranteed fit. Your parts also guaranteed to fit your ride each and every time including the first time, or your money's coming back to you. Because with eBay Motors, you are burning rubber, and crucially, you are not burning cash. With all the parts that you need to have the prices that you're looking for, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win that you are seeking. Keep your ride or die alive right now at ebaymotors.com. One more time, the place to go is ebaymotors.com. eBay guaranteed fizzle available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. 
Today's show is brought to you by our sponsor, BetterHelp. And sometimes we need the opportunity to get something off of our chest. Big or small, certain things can actually start to get to you if you let them. It's more like lots of stuff out, especially someone who is, happens to be unbiased on your life. So today I want to tell you something that actually has been bothering me sometimes. Maybe for a few of you, you might happen to understand what I'm saying here. And that is that I have some real unease about the next steps in the media industry right now. Not about just the way the Hawks are covered and like that, but whether there's actually going to be jobs available for what I do, whether the work that I do in different ways will actually be able to continue how it is now. Of course, not the most life-altering team in the world for some people, but therapy can be different for everybody. Most of us, including me, have bigger problems than this particular thing involving sports and media, et cetera. But it is quite important to get things off your chest every once in a while. And if you think of starting about therapy, you can actually give BetterHelp a try right now. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. And the place to go is betterhelp.com slash locked on MBA. Get 10% off your first month of BetterHelp. That's betterhelp.com slash locked on MBA. One more time, the place to go is better, H E L P, betterhelp.com slash locked on MBA. Okay, quick note here. Actually, it's not really regarding to this game, but Sadiq Bey actually had his surgery, which was uh, not announced for like two weeks. He, of course, had got hurt almost three weeks ago at this point, but he had surgery on Wednesday in New York. He tore his SEL on the 10th, so uh, he'll be in New York for a while longer, and then he actually has some recovery from there. So nothing really actionable. Obviously, he's out for the season, but um, obviously we're for Sadiq to get healthy and be ready for partial, at least part of next season, that would be the hope at this point in time. Um, interestingly enough, from there on the, on the player side, of course, we talked about Dejounte earlier. I'll probably say his numbers again later on. But it was uh, only four guys in double figures for the Hawks in a game that scored 120 points. So it was it was not really balanced, other than uh, from Dejounte being at the top of the uh, at the top of the heap here. But on the bench, the Hawks actually played pretty well. I thought with their second unit in this game, they kind of broke even, which is all you can really ask for. Um, Trent Forrest played six minutes, four points, and an assist. By the way, Dejounte played 47 minutes in the game. Uh, so Trent only played with DeJounte out. They were minus two of those minutes. That, that was perfectly fine, to be honest with you, because uh, I thought Trent kind of did his job pretty pretty solidly. Garrison Matthews play, actually played 17 minutes. That was less than I would have guessed for him. Seven points on three shots. Sorry, three, three, five from three. Sorry, three, five from the floor. One of three from three. Uh, had an assist. Had a rebound. Was dead even in the plus minus. Wes Matthews played 24 minutes. That's a what's way more than he usually plays. Let's just say, but um, defensively did his job for the most part. He was one of five on threes and actually zero of one on twos in this game, but had three points, five rebounds, three assists, and had the one big offensive rebound at the end that led to the jump ball, which led to a possession, and that ended up being a huge swing in Atlanta's favor. Bruno Fernando played twenty minutes, six rebounds, sorry, six points, four rebounds, two assists, a steal, and a block for Bruno in uh, and actually didn't miss a shot in this game. Uh, he played less than uh, you would have thought because Capella actually played more than he has in a long time. Granted, that was because of overtime, but 33 minutes for Clint. They've been trying to keep an eye on his minutes for quite some time now. Um, 12 points, 13 rebounds, two blocks, three assists. Clint is playing very well. I asked Quinn about Clint pregame tonight, actually, and he kind of just said the words. That I think he said the phrase that he used was that Clint has been dialed in, quote unquote, uh, in recent days. That's 100% true. Clint's been playing very, very well, and that continued in this game. He was a big part of the win for the Hawks. Um DeAndre Hunter had a big uh, quarter. I mentioned before he had 14 and a quarter, had 21 points and 13 rebounds for DeAndre. Obviously, the free throws were a little bit shaky, 0 of 3 there, but made up for it with five threes. He was 3 of 7 on twos, but 5 of 9 from 3. Uh, good night for him across the board. Defensively did his job, kind of at least bothering Tatum and Brown at different times in this one. Um, Bogdanovich had a big game, 24 points, 7 rebounds, 5 assists for, for, for Bogey. In this one, he actually was on the podium with DeJounte after the game. A couple of big shots from Bogey, including the big three in the fourth quarter. And then uh, beat Krejci, 35 minutes, one shot attempt, <laughs> three rebounds, an assist, and he fouled out. Crazy stuff there. And then one more time, just the full stat line on DeJounte, 44 points, seven rebounds, seven assists, two steals. He was 12 of 25 <laughs> on twos and six of 19 on threes. Uh, just a crazy, crazy, crazy number of shots for a single player. But uh, he needed it in this game, and they needed it all the way through. So a memorable win for the Hawks, an awesome one. Um, just to say it out loud, people ask me like what this means. It's still one game. Well, I guess it's two games against Boston this week in March. But, you know, the Hawks are in good shape now when it comes to the nine seed. Like, I think that you can sort of get carried away. And I, I would probably urge you not to go too crazy about big picture stuff with this, about like the playoffs and that stuff. But the Hawks could see the Celtics again in the first round. That is very, very possible. And as I mentioned several times in this podcast, Last year's playoff series against Boston was closer than people remember that it was. You know, the Hawks won a couple games in that series. 
Boston was a better team, but the Hawks pushed them a decent amount. And, you know, if they, if they can get a little bit healthy, I, I think if the Hawks had their current roster, um, I know they beat them twice this week, I would be a little bit worried about that. But if they get Jalen back, if they get Trey back, if they get Onyeka back, they can, they can push Boston in the series for sure. Um, speaking of which, the Bulls actually won their last game, but the Hawks are only one game behind the Bulls. And uh, looking ahead a little bit, they play the Bulls on Monday. If the Hawks beat the Bulls on Monday, it's a road game. If they win that game, the nine seed looks like it's uh, right there in front of you. If you lose that one, you already have a tiebreaker loss to bought to the Chicago. You're probably in some trouble. So that's one to circle for sure. But um, they are seriously within the race for the nine seed. And uh, the 10 seed has not been clinched at this point, but it's all been clinched. They're actually up six games on the nets with nine to play. So if the Hawks were to go uh, 0-9, which they won't do, uh, I don't think, Brooklyn would have to Brooklyn would then have to go uh what four and five to beat them? No, sorry, the other way around. They'd have to go seven and two to beat them. That's not happening. Uh anyway, moving on uh to the sort of next the up next portion of the podcast. The Hawks play again on Saturday against Milwaukee. Uh the Bucks are good, of course. They're the two seed currently in the Eastern Conference. But they've actually lost their last two games in a row. Um, and obviously they're not like better than Boston. Um, I think Dame left the game tonight in a loss for Milwaukee. If I am uh, at least seeing that correctly as I'm looking up, uh, he might he might come back in, but um, notable there. Um, that's another game where the Hawks are probably going to be underdogs, but obviously being an underdog is not stop them this week and be Boston twice. So keep an eye on that one. And that'll be our next our next podcast episode, barring some huge news on Friday, which I'm not expecting. I'm going to take and then take Friday off and record again on Saturday. A tough one for the Hawks, and they still look for five straight wins, but they are certainly um, playing. Good basketball right now. There's no question about that. Uh, nine games left in the season. The Hawks, uh, I guess, in theory, could still finish 500 if they were to go 7-2 and two in the last nine games. That's not super likely, I don't think, to happen, but it's possible with the way they're playing. And, uh, you know, good vibes all around. A fun locker room post game tonight. Uh, Dejounte, huge one. Bogey, Bogey was happy, upbeat, and uh, believe it there for now. So hopefully I'm, I'm not rambling too much. It's very, very late into the evening on Friday. It's been a long week. And my apologies for the... Uh, differing uh, backdrop that I usually have here. I, if you missed this yesterday, I actually had to move unexpectedly. So I'm still putting things together. Hopefully it sounds and looks okay, but I'll have uh, more of my normal setup as things go forward. So uh, all that said, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple or Spotify or on YouTube or on Pocket Cast. Anywhere you listen to the podcast, we should be there. If not, let me know and I'll fix that. But uh, please subscribe, rate, review, share, like all that fun stuff. Also, if you're an audio-only subscriber, you can find the postcast from the folks at Locked on Sports Atlanta in the same feed. Nothing less from me, just some extra content for you. Um, also, follow the show on Twitter, slash X, at, B- sorry, at BT Rule is myself, and also at Locked on Hawks for the actual show account. I write about the Hawks on a regular basis at patreon.com slash BT Rolling. I shared some audio there pregame tonight from Quinn Snyder. That's all a good, fun place to have some extra stuff in Hawks land, so stay tuned for that as well. Thanks for listening. I really do appreciate it. Enjoy your Friday, Saturday, and then we'll see you after the game on Saturday in Atlanta because, again, Hawks, Bucks, and the Hawks have been aiming for, fifth, for their fifth straight win. That's a pretty crazy scenario there after this week, and we'll see you after that game.